So I want to just finish off yesterday's lecture if I can, and then uh, I'll let you work on the lab. I'll talk a little bit about the lab before we, you get going on it. So we were talking yesterday about this Webpack tool, which is a build tool for uh, web applications. And essentially, if I fast forward to, let's say, this slide, this kind of tells the picture of what Webpack does, which is, uh, on the left, we see the various modules that might make up a web application. Those modules could be a combination of JavaScript files or JavaScript modules. Each file is a module. It could also include CSS modules. It could include static image modules or indeed font modules as well. The If we take the JavaScript and CSS modules, uh, or files, they could be written in just pure JavaScript, or they may have uh, TypeScript or CoffeeScript, which is other languages that can be converted back to JavaScript. Or in the case of what you're doing in Web App Dev, you have, okay, they are JavaScript files, but they contain uh, JSX code, which also has to be converted to pure JavaScript. And by pure JavaScript, we often refer to it as ES5 JavaScript. So the modules that make up your web application could be a combination of any of those uh, types of source code. And what Webpack does is it takes all of those modules, starting at what's called an entry point. The entry point is the the the, the top file in your uh, in your module hierarchy, if you like. And in the case of your your React app, for example, it's the src slash index.js file. It starts at that point, and then it navigates down through the dependency hierarchy of your application by following the import statements. So it's able to build a picture uh, uh, that we have on the left. And it takes each of the modules, it carries out a transformation of the code in those modules if it needs to be transformed. So for example, it will transform JSX to pure JavaScript. And what it produces on the right-hand side is what we call a bundle, or it's also referred to as a chunk. Uh, and the bundle contains your source code converted into pure JavaScript and pure CSS uh, and possibly any just images, bundles them all in together into one physical file, which we refer to as the bundle file. And it's that file then that is actually sent to your browser, which the browser can execute. So in the image that I'm showing you here, all of the modules on the left, whether they be JavaScript or CSS or images, they're all bundled into one uh, output file. But alternatively, you can get Webpack to produce a number of bundles. And this is where the bundles are often referred to as chunks. And the bundles typically are a combination of JavaScript bundles, CSS uh, bundle or bundles and image bundle or bundles. And you can control how many of the JavaScript bundles should be produced. And I will see in today's lecture how you control that in the case of a React app anyway. So that's what Webpack is all about, uh, creating these bundles or chunks uh, from your source module hierarchy. And you'll be doing that in next week's lab. So if I fast forward to where we left off yesterday, which was uh, talking about, well, when we're producing these bundles for a production environment, 
then we want the bundles to be as small as possible. And we also want to avail of caching, which is the intrinsic to the way the web works. And thirdly, then I want to talk about something called code splitting. And it's this code splitting is what allows us as developers to control how many bundles are created from your source module hierarchy. So that's where I'm going to pick up the story, I think, uh, which is where I left it off yesterday. I explained how caching works in the context of Webpack, the idea that Webpack produces, um, it produce, it names the bundles based on the content of them using a hashing uh, name convention. I might come back to that in a little while. So it's this code spitting uh, idea that I want to just cover this morning. So uh, code splitting is all about introducing what are called dynamic imports into your source code. Uh, you see, the only types of imports that we are using up to now are static imports, which I'll, I'll compare and contrast the two in a minute. But dynamic imports, what? What dynamic imports do is, what their effect is, that they split your app's uh, code into uh, in individual bundles or multiple bundles. So I'm saying it splits the app's custom code, which is the code that you write, into multiple bundles as opposed to just one single bundle that contains everything. And this is where the bundles are often referred to as chunks. And then the benefit of that is that the browser only loads the chunks or bundles that it needs uh, based on the runtime execution of your of your app. So we often say that it loads the chunks lazily or on demand as it needs the code. And the why what's the benefit of that? Well, it means that we reduce the initial app's load time which is one of our objectives. So we try and minimize the amount of code that needs to be loaded into the browser uh, initially in order to get the application up and running. Uh, the, the, so we're creating multiple bundles now and the bundle file names have this naming convention. Again, there's a hash part to the name. There's a .chunk.js extension and the first part I'm just calling name, but its name is actually arbitrarily chosen by Webpack. So this part here, we've talked about kind of yesterday, the dot chunk part is just a Webpack convention and they're ending in .js. It's only the JavaScript code now that we can avail of this dynamic imports idea. We can't apply it to our CSS if we did write custom CSS. So I'm going to use a simple little web app to demonstrate this. And if I just show you the app working first, so it's uh, it's very straightforward, but let's just get it up and running. So I have the source code here, which we'll look at in a second. It's a, a React app that's built using the Create React App tool. And so if I start up my development server, just to show you it running for a start. So this is my app's homepage, Maria. And again, I'm just using TMDB and all of that behind the scenes as well, because you're familiar with that. So the homepage just displays a title uh, and a text box and a button. And the idea is when I click this button, only then does my app request 20 movies from TMDB and displays them. So I'll do that. Now I'm not concerned with the UI side of this, the how it looks. So I'm not using material UI at all. I'm just using a tiny bit of custom CSS and I'm doing that purposefully. But anyway, in terms of how the application works, I'm gonna click my button. 
And these are 20 movies that have been returned by TMDB. And if I click on any one of them, I get to a detailed page for that movie. Now, I'm not concerned with displaying the details of the movie in any kind of uh, stylish way. I'm essentially just displaying the, the JSON that has been returned by TMDB. But that's okay. Uh, and there's a link here, which if I click, it will show me all of the people that have reviewed this movie, if there are any. I'm not sure if there are for this one. But it doesn't happen to be. So I'll just go back to the home page. And if I take this movie here, take more reviews, then these are the people that have reviewed that movie. So there's, uh, what is it, three pages in total. The home page, the movie details page, let's call it, and the reviewers page. Okay, so that's all the app does. Now, what we're interested, though, is this idea of dynamic imports. So if we go back to our slides, uh, all I'm showing you here is just how, you know, it's, again, it's nothing to do with the, the core focus of this, but I'm just showing you how the uh, the home page works, you know, this idea that if I go back to it, if I go back to the home page, the way the it works is this but this this button here has an on click handler. And in the home page itself, which is really what I'm showing you in this slide, this is from the home page. Um I've got a state variable, which is this one here. And this state variable just toggles from true to false. Uh, I've initialized it to false. And this state variable also, it actually controls the displaying of the list of movies. Because if I go right down to the bottom here, I'm checking the value of this state variable. And if it's true, then I render this filtered uh, movie list component and it's this component that's what actually causes if I click the button that's what generates this output here if you like okay so by clicking the button it either displays all the movies or it doesn't if you like I think if I click it again it will stop displaying them okay so that's just a little bit of logic really that's going on behind the scenes although it's got nothing to do with dynamic imports now i'm just showing you how that piece of logic works what's important though is i suppose is that this component down here the filtered movie list component we don't really need that component to be loaded with the home page until the user clicks the button so if we could actually package that component into a bundle of its own and then only load that component into the browser when the user clicks the, the button, that's really what we're trying to achieve here. However, before I talk about how we do that, though, let's talk about static imports versus dynamic imports. Static imports are what you're used to already, OK? So any of the kind of standard import statements that you've used, those import statements are resolved at build time. Okay, so when we do our npm run build, uh, Webpack resolves all of those import statements. In other words, it actually goes and finds the module and includes the module in the bundle that it's created. So Webpack bundles you're, because because our application is only using static imports up to now, Webpack will bundle the entire application into one bundle. Okay, because it actually resolves those imports at build time, uh, and that that includes all the node modules. So the the single bundle, which it, the name it gives it is main. That main bundle contains all of our source code and all of the node modules uh, 
uh, node modules, modules as well. They're all uh, packaged into the single bundle that it creates. So when you're using static imports, I'm showing you here on the right that you only have one JavaScript bundle, which is this one here. Okay, it's conventionally by Webpack. The name is main. This part here now we know to be a hash value that it computes based on the contents of the bundle and it ends in .js. I am showing you actually that there is a second bundle which is a CSS bundle. And the only reason uh, its Webpack is creating a separate CSS bundle is because I do have some custom CSS code. And can we see it? Uh, let's, if I show you the index.js, well, first of all, if I if we just look at the, the contents of this project, let's not worry about the build for a minute. Uh, obviously, we've got an SRC folder that has the various pages and components, but I do have a custom CSS file. And the only reason I'm using this is just to show you the fact that Webpack will create a separate bundle with all of your CSS. That's its default behavior. Uh, if you have custom CSS. Now, in the app that you are developing in the web app dev module, I don't think you have any custom CSS. All of the CSS is being managed by Material UI, and all of the Material UI stuff is being brought into your application by using static imports. Hence, uh, there's, uh, there's no separate CSS bundle being created for your movies app. Uh, but because I'm using some custom CSS and in my index.js, I import that custom CSS. Now, Webpack is clever enough to realize, well, okay, this is a static import, but the type of thing that you're importing is CSS. You're not importing a JavaScript. And so it goes away and creates a separate bundle containing all of your custom CSS, very little in, our, in my case. I mean, that's that's the, the extent of my custom CSS. Uh, but it has put that into a separate bundle. And that's all I'm showing you in this slide here. OK, it has a second bundle, but it contains CSS. But this is the bundle that we're interested in. And this bundle, because in my JavaScript code, I am using static imports everywhere then all of the JavaScript is bundled into one bundle file. And this is it here. So that means when I load the home page or when a user loads the home page into their browser, the entire application is downloaded into the browser, even though we only need a small bit of the application. We just need the JavaScript code that renders the the home page, in other words, just renders this stuff here. We don't need to see the JavaScript code that produces this, and neither do we need the JavaScript code that produces this. But in particular, let's focus on this part here. We don't need the JavaScript code that generates this uh, output for us. OK, we need all the node modules, OK but uh, we can't really control that. So what I'm showing you in this screenshot is the fact that the main bundle is downloaded initially, which contains everything, even though, as I've already said, we only really need the custom or custom code that produces this. Now, to prove this to you, uh, here I'm back on my project, and you can take it from me now that everywhere I'm using static imports. So if I build my application, I'm not, I don't want to use the React development server, so I'm going to stop that. I'm going to go npm run build.
the webpack is doing its thing uh, behind the scenes and it's generating all of its output into the build folder that we talked about yesterday. And if I drill down into it and into the static part and the JS part, there's my main bundle. And uh, I've already explained there is also in the static, there is a CSS bundle, uh, which we'll just not pay any attention to right now. So there's the main bundle. Now I want to start up a basic HTTP server that serves this static version of my application to me. And yesterday I talked about the the serve server, which you can install as a separate package. And I've done that. And if I just go back to the slides uh, and go way back to one of the earlier slides from yesterday, that being this one here. So if I just type in this command, npx serve uh, minus s, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to start up my standard HTTP server, and it's going to serve the contents of the build folder, and it's going to make it available on port, uh, whatever port you want to. I just use port 3000 for convenience. So let's do that. So my server is up and running so that there's no uh, there's no live reloading or any of that uh, sort of fancy stuff available to us here now as you would have with the uh, with the development server that you have been using properly up to now in the web app dev module so i'll navigate to localhost 3000 it's still localhost 3000 but it's a static version and I'm going to open up my developer tools because we need to see what's happening at the network level behind the scenes. So I'll do that. And I'm particularly interested in the, the kind of network communication. So if I select the networks tab uh, here, it's selected already, actually. Now I'm going to do a manual refresh to, to explain what I, I want to explain here. So I'm just going to do a manual refresh. And you can see here on the left, all of the uh, assets that are downloaded by my HTTP server down to the browser. And in particular, we can see that it downloads the CSS bundle and the JS bundle, the JS bundle first, then the CSS bundle. So this is the bundle that contains all of my JavaScript code. And that's what allows it it then executes that JavaScript essentially, okay? And it displays what we see on the left. The other stuff is, this is where it's actually making a HTTP request to TMDB for my 20 movies. So I do request those at the outset, okay. Uh, might be nice if we could delay that, but that would require a lot more ingenuity in our part. Uh, and it's outside of Webpack's kind of control. The main point I want to make now is because I'm using static imports everywhere, I only have one bundle, which is one JavaScript bundle, which is this one that's downloaded to the browser and it contains everything. And even when I click this button here, okay, th there's no extra activity over here. And when I click onto the details page, Okay, there is a hit, there is a TMDB request made okay, but from a bundles point of view, there's no new bundles being downloaded because we have got everything in the main bundle. And if if main was extremely large, which it isn't in our case, and if our server was running remotely, which it isn't in our case, then the initial load time of our application would be affected by that fact, by the fact that we are downloading all of our code to the browser 
during the initial page load, if you like. How can we uh, try and reduce the amount of JavaScript code that's downloaded to the browser initially? And the answer is use dynamic imports. So let's go back to where we were. So we've got static imports everywhere. And I've shown you that because we've got static imports everywhere, there's only one bundle that contains all of our JavaScript code. That's OK. Now, let's use dynamic imports to try and break up the main bundle into sub bundles. So dynamic imports, uh, uh, they are actually resolved at runtime. Static imports are resolved at build time. Dynamic imports are resolved at runtime. And what they allow us to do is, um, wh what React does is React, uh, React has a special function called the lazy function. And it, this is what allows us to achieve these dynamic imports in the case of React anyway. And it lets you uh, it lets you render a dynamic import at uh, sorry, what does that say? It lets you let you render it as if it's a regular component. Okay, let's maybe Webpack creates. This is where we're kind of interested. Webpack creates separate bundles for each dynamically imported uh, for each dynamic import. That now means that the main bundle size is potentially reduced because there's less code that needs to go into it, but we have other sub bundles that are being generated. And the other sub bundles, they're not downloaded initially, they're only downloaded uh, on the on demand, if you like, based on the navigation done by the user. In our case, we're going to have a separate bundle that contains that contains the code that I go back to here. We are going to put the code that generates this list of movies into a separate bundle because we don't need that code. Uh, during the initial page load. The initial page load happens like this. It's only when the user clicks the button, it's only then we should, that our browser should request the additional bundle uh, that is required to render my list of movies. And that, in our case, that's the filtered movie list uh, component. So we need to dynamically import that component. It's really where I'm trying to get at here. So here I am now looking at my home page, but instead of having a static import for that special component, here's how I'm importing it uh, dynamically. I'm using this lazy function, which is just one. This is how we do it in React. It's a function that's available in the React library. And so this is just the syntax of how you dynamically import a component. And again, as I said, the component in my case is contained within this uh, this particular JavaScript file, which is the one that contains the filtered movie component in my case. Now, because I've got that dynamic import statement in my home page, when I build my application, I now have in two JavaScript pack uh, bundles. I have I still have the main bundle. It's called main but it doesn't have all of my code in this case. There's a sep second bundle, which has got a, uh, this is the name of the bundle. It's just an arbitrary name that's generated by Webpack. This is the bundle's hash value. And the extension is .chunk.js in the case of Webpack anyway. Curiously, it doesn't use the .chunk.js for the main bundle, but that's just by the way. So I now have two JavaScript bundles in my application. The main bundle is going to be downloaded to the browser when the user navigates to this application, but this bundle here won't be downloaded until the user clicks the button and requests the rendering of the actual uh, 
of this component, this filter movie list component. And so let's do that. So all I have to do in my code is let's go to my home page. So here's my, uh, here is my, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. So I need to this it, remove the static import and bring in my dynamic import. That now means that this component, which is being used down here to, it's being used here to generate the list of movies. You can ignore this suspense for a moment. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that component, this, this component we can see is being dynamically imported as a result of this statement here, which means that that component is not going to be downloaded in a bundle to the browser, in my case, until the user clicks the button. And so let's, uh, I need to rebuild because I've changed my source code now. I need to rebuild. Stop my HTTP server. Do a rebuild. And if I look inside the build folder now, as the slides indicated, I go into the JS. There's now a, there, I still have a main, a bundle called main uh, here, but I have this other bundle now as well. And you know, this, this part here is just an arbitrary name given to the bundle. It has no real uh, significance that I'm aware of anyway. The, this part here is the hash value, as I've already explained. So this bundle contains the filtered movie component. Now, if I start up my HTTP server again, I close off my browser tab. I don't really have to, but close that. And we're interested in, in what's happening at the network level. So if I do a manual refresh again, okay, it's uh, same as before. It's still downloading the main.js, although the contents of that is different now. Now, when I click this button here, you will notice that there's going to be some activity over here. So let's do that. So I'm clicking the button that triggered the dynamic import statement in my code, which caused my browser to request the actual chunk that it needed in order to be able to display this list of movies. And that chunk is this one here. And it, it contains the code for rendering the list of movies. So that's an illustration of resolving an import at runtime as opposed to build time and the way i achieved it was by using that lazy function provided by react that's how react does it other frameworks would do it slightly differently the key of the the generic uh concept here though is dynamic imports imports that are resolved at runtime as opposed to uh build time and dynamic imports will cause a build tool, Webpack in our case, to generate multiple bundles uh, for your application. Now, uh, 
what I've been slightly overlooking though is just using dynamic imports didn't really achieve what I showed you there, what I demonstrated. Uh, there is a second requirement when, uh, in the case of a React anyway, which is you've got to wrap the component that is dynamically imported. You've got to wrap that in a special component called the suspense component in the case of React. And so in the screenshot I'm showing you here, here's where I'm referring to my, uh, here's where I'm referring to my filtered movie list component, the one that's dynamically imported, but I have to wrap that in a suspense component. Uh, it doesn't have to wrap it immediately. You know, it can be, the suspense component could be up at this level here. Uh, and what the purpose of the suspense co component is, its purpose is to render something else while the browser is waiting for the dynamically imported bundle to be downloaded. You know, we don't see it uh, when I click, when I go back to here now, if I just do a manual refresh. Uh, when, when I click the button, there's obviously going to be a delay between uh, the rendering of the list of movies uh, and the time that I actually cl click the button because the bundle has to be downloaded from the server. Now, because I'm running the server locally, you know, it's almost instantaneous, but uh, that wouldn't be the case in a, a real life situation. So when what should be displayed here uh, while the browser is waiting for the bundle to be downloaded uh, and that's what the role of the suspense component is. It will actually provide the alternative that should be displayed here. And so if I look at what we are seeing on this, uh, all I've decided, and it's just something arbitrary, if I just zoom in a little bit, I've told it to just display this heading uh, in the location where it would normally display this component. So it's a kind of a, it's a fallback as the, as the uh, 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 prop is called. It's a fallback for while the browser is waiting. So the suspense com component has to play as that kind of role. Uh, as I said, you don't see the benefit of it in, in my demonstration. If you take out the suspense component, then it, it just won't work. In fact, could I prove that to you? Uh, let's see if I go into my source code. And if I just actually comment out this stuff. If I do a rebuild, and restart my server. And I can just go back here and do a manual refresh. Click my button. Huh. See, let's do that again, actually. Do a manual refresh. I'm not just going to stop my server. Okay. 
wonder is uh, let's see yeah it's this is it's probably working now because there's caching going on in the in the browser let's see um Yeah, I think it's it's because it's been cached. You see, you can see a 304 status code here for the extra bundle. Um, and 304 means that the browser has cached it from earlier, so it's, it's just reusing it. I think that may be what's going on there. Uh, according to the documentation, anyway, you've got to use the suspense component uh, at around any dynamic import. Uh, it's unfortunate now that that didn't that wasn't clear though but uh, let's just plow on anyway i just want to undo that and undo that Okay, uh, I've demonstrated that. Now, uh, another place where you can use this dynamic imports idea, what I've demonstrated to you so far is using dynamic imports around a particular component. And that component may have uh, children. Uh, I didn't show you the code for the component. It's not terribly interesting to be honest but uh let's see the component itself was this one here there's no special uh, code that you have to put into the dynamically imported component it can be anything it wants to be it, it is fairly trivial in this case now but uh so be it but uh the, the second place where you can use dynamic imports is around what's called root based code splitting and so if we if we look at the generic example let's suppose i've got this application and okay it has a kind of home page so what i'm trying to get across here is each circle now is maria representing a component okay so the home page uh is generated by this component which delegates to this component okay that's normal kind of stuff the application also has a slash page one root and in that case these components over here are used to generate page one and i've got a page two as well but in terms of code splitting really it's only these components that are enclosed in red only those components need to be downloaded to the browser initially. Uh, all of the components around page one and page two, they can be downloaded to the browser on demand. So we could put all of these components to the left, put those into a separate bundle, and equally put all of the components to the right into a separate bundle. So we would have uh, three comp three uh chunks or bundles in this case this would be the main one and these other two then were would, would be named by webpack uh, so we're doing the code splitting based around the different routes that make up your application and so how do we achieve that it's it's the same as before really uh, it just simply means that we Whatever this component is, we dynamically imported it because it's the parent of this subroot, if you like. And we dynamically import this component because it's the parent of this subset of components. Uh, and they would be in your, uh, they would probably be in your routing configuration. Um, so from a code point of view, Here's where I've got uh, all my routing configuration, which you're familiar with from uh, from web dev. I've wrapped 
my entire routing configuration, I've wrapped it in a suspense component uh, because I did say to you that the suspense component can be really anywhere within your component hierarchy as long as it encloses at some level the dynamically imported parts. Now, the dynam what's being dynamically imported in my case is... Oh, oh, sorry, I'm I'm demonstrating it here now. I'm demonstrating root-based code splitting for my movie's detail page. So let's just go back to the demo. When I click on this, any one of these movies here, I'm I'm going to a different route, you know, and you can see that happening up here. So it's this page in my little sample application. I want to make this page or this route dyna dynamically imported or the code associated with, with it dynamically imported. And so that's what I'm showing you excerpts from here. This is the particular import in my in uh in my app.js i think uh, where do I, let's look at the actual code rather than screenshots of it maybe so if i go into index.js which is here right i have my i'm using react query that's okay we're not worried about that here's my routing configuration and because i've only got one uh well okay i've got two pages i've got the the reviewers page and i've got the movies page but uh I, i'll just ignore the reviewers page for now anyway here's where i import statically the movie details page or the sorry that's not it so beg your pardon it's this one let's see get it right um Here it is. Here's where I statically import the the movies page. But if I change that to a dynamic import, which would be like this. And because I've got a dynamic import, and where does this component appear in my JSX? So we know where it is. It's going to be, uh, it's in one of my roots. Here it is here, it's being used. And so wherever the dynamically imported component is being is being referred to in your JSX, you've got to wrap that in a suspense component as I've talked about. And so I put the, I just arbitrarily said, I put the suspense component around the entire routing. Okay, so I now have two dynamic imports i have the movies page dynamic import and i still have the filtered movie list component being dynamically imported okay so i've got an, an example of root based code splitting and individual component code splitting if you like so if i rebuild my application i should now have three bundles three javascript bundles the main one the one that will encapsulate my movies page, and thirdly, the one that has the filtered movie list component within it and any children that it might have. So let's do a final build. And if I look inside the static JS, here I've got one component, two components, sorry, one, one bundle or chunk, another chunk, and I still have a chunk called uh, main. Yeah, three in total. And if I run my HTTP server and watch these bundles being downloaded on demand. So 
I'm just going to go back to the home page and do a manual refresh so we can see things happening. So initially main.js is downloaded. When I click my button here, the component that renders the list should be downloaded. So if we watch what's happening over here, I click on it. Yeah, that's now being downloaded, although it's using a cached version of it. That's okay. And if I now click on one of the movies to get the movies detail page, I should now see another bundle being downloaded by my server. Yeah, and it's a 200 this time because it hasn't seen that bundle before. Uh, oh yeah, it's a 200, uh, all right. Show why it's giving me oh and I'd say it's giving me the 304 there again because unfortunately I was actually on the home page when I went to the browser. I wonder could I that's kind of annoying me now actually. Let's say uh, let me do one thing. Just gonna make one change to try and change. Let's see if I go into my source code. Just bear with me for a second. Movies detail page, yeah. I'm just gonna make a an arbitrary change to this so that the bundle will have a different, hopefully in it will have a different hash value. I'll just go movies details. Page let read two. And I'm going to make a change to the component as well, the filtered movie list component. Can I do that? I wonder. Easily, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. I'm just going to make something up. Uh, Hopefully all of that is okay syntactically. And let's go through a rebuild again. So I'm probably not going to get me anywhere now, but let's uh, just bear with me. Start my server. Click my button. Uh, 
Okay, so I am getting a 200 this time because it's a new bundle. And when I navigate to the detail page, you know, it brings in the bundle for the details page, which is also a 200, fortunately, this time. So there's no caching going on. Okay, um, so that worked, uh, thankfully. So all we're, the point I'm going to get across is this idea of dynamic imports are how we achieve multiple bundles. And why do we want to achieve multiple bundles? Because we want to minimize the load, the initial load time of the application. And one way of doing that is by having the main bundle as small as we can make it. Um, and I've, uh, I've demonstrated how you do that. Now, because this application is so tiny uh, and it's really the node modules part of my application, that's what's consuming pretty much you know, 99%, if not even more, 99.9% of the size of the bundled code, then we don't see a huge benefit to using dynamic imports here. If we were to actually analyze the, the size of the, the bundles, um, it's, it's minuscule really in terms of what improvements we're getting. But for larger applications, it would be significant. Okay, I've demonstrated that. And you can take that root-based code splitting down into nested roots as well. So in this kind of generic example here again, like I've got page one, page two, but supposing there are subroots within page two called foo and another one called bar, then you know these could be split into bundles as well. So we could have one bundle for this, another bundle for all of this, a bundle for this, a bundle for this, and for this. So that's one, two, three, four, five bundles, um, potentially. How can you see what is actually contained within a bundle? And the answer is you use what's called a source map explorer. Remember, I, I did mention briefly about source maps yesterday. You don't have to uh, worry about uh, how this explorer works, but the source map explorer uh, gives you a visual representation of the contents of a bundle, the internals of a bundle. And that's what the screenshot is, 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 uh, is showing us. And if I just show you how this, uh, so this source map explorer um, is a package that you can install. And so if I go back to my little demo application, and if I look at package.json, inside one of the dev dependencies, let's see, is this guy here. So you just need to add that to your package.json. And to generate these this visual representation, I've, I've just put a script into uh, the package.json to do it for me. So that's this is the full command for generating this visual representation. If you just bear with me for one second, because I need to, my computer is running out of juice. Okay, sorry about that. So if I just run this from the command line. I 
And so we have three bundles and if there's a little drop down menu here that allows you to select the bundles. And so if I select, let's say this one, which is the one I think that contains the future movie list components. So if I want to see what is inside in that bundle, and lo and behold, it's our filtered movie list uh, component and also the movie. I had a movie component uh, and that's that's about it. There's only two, two modules within this bundle. And, you know, there's actually some unused space within the bundle uh, because... There's, I guess there's a minimum size to a bundle. So there's a bit of wasted space here. If I look at one of the other bundles, uh, this is the one that contains the movie details page. And that looks like what it contains and nothing else, just contains one module. That's why I said really this illustration isn't, you know, isn't, isn't the best for demonstrating uh, the benefits of dynamic imports, but uh, so be it. And finally, if I look at the main bundle, it's completely dominated by the contents of node modules. So, uh, sorry, did I select, uh, I selected the wrong one, sorry. Oh yeah, that's, uh, this, this is the main bundle. And, you know, it has all of the, um, you know, one, it looks like one of the biggest modules is the React DOM um, uh, package, if you like. Or, and if I just navigate up a little bit higher, you know, we can see lots of the other uh, various other modules, all of which are coming from the node modules folder, as it turns out. Now, this bundle does contain some of my custom components but because they're so tiny compared to all of the node module stuff we can't actually we'd have to really start digging around the place to try and find them but they are in there and the benefits of these explorer uh, is it helps you to maybe work out well what what modules are taking up an awful lot of space in a bundle? And is it possible for me to uh, use an alternative module? Or is it possible for me to trim down that module if it's available to me? Uh, or if it's if the if the third party module allows me to do that. Uh, so what the explorer allows us to do is to, as I said, to see what's inside a bundle and ideally to uh let's see what's that say identify the oh yeah identify the primary contributors to a bundle which i was just saying and then this is what maybe you, you could do to try and reduce the bundle size to perform what's called tree shaking this is a term that's used in this whole area if you if you are if you've identified a module within a bundle that is taking up a large amount of space, and when you look at uh, your source code and you see there are only particular parts of that third party module that you actually need, you don't need the entire module, then tree shaking is this idea of only importing the particular parts of the module that you need and, and therefore reduce the bundle size. Now, lots of third party modules support this tree shaking idea, others don't. So it's, it really depends on whether the module facilitates tree shaking or not. And if I just give you a simple example of what I mean by tree shaking, and I'm showing it to you down here in the, in the screenshot. So there is a third party module called the uh, what's it called? The the Lodash module, uh, which you may or may not have heard. The Lodash module contains lots of really nice functions for processing objects and arrays. 
Now, if I don't avail of tree shaking and I just import the entire module, it turns out that it takes up uh, something like 71 kilobytes. Okay, I've, I, I kind of checked that myself. So here I'm importing the entire Lodash module. Uh, but it turns out I'm only using one function within it, the truncate function, which I think is a function that you use in the web app dev uh, movies app. But the Lodash module supports tree shaking. So instead of importing the entire module, over here on the right, I'm only importing the particular part of it that I need, which in my case is just one function. And by doing that, I will now have reduced the size of the bundle that contains this code, whichever bundle it is, it doesn't really matter. I reduced the size uh, down to uh, 4.5 kilobytes. Well, um, I haven't reduced it by that. I've reduced it by the difference between 4.5 and 71.1. Okay, so you can see the difference between the two of them. So this is using tree shake. Here I'm, I'm using tree shaking because the lower dash module uh, supports it on the left i'm not using tree shaking even though the module supports it so that's where these source map explorers can be very useful now you don't have to worry about uh, reducing bundle sizes or any of that in in your in your assignment all you'll be doing is demonstrating uh, dynamic import uh, dynamic imports uh, just just avail of that feature Right, uh, that took a little bit longer than I was planning, but uh, there you go. Next week's lab covers Webpack, covers dynamic imports. So I actually get you to take this little demo application that I've uh, been talking my way through and essentially put in the, the dynamic imports that I've shown you. And also, I ask you to go looking for someplace else where you could use dynamic imports within this application. That's kind of the exercise in it. I'll just pause for a second if in case there's any questions related to what I've just been talking about. No. In terms of this week's lab, So this week's lab is all about GitLab. Let me just bring it up. And at the very beginning of the lab, I ask you to create a an account on the GitLab service. Now you will need to I think I mentioned this uh, when I talked about GitLab two weeks ago. You will need to provide a credit card as far as I can remember uh, when you create your account. I created my account about three years ago uh, and it, it wasn't a requirement, but last year's students were, were telling me that they, they had to. They didn't really incur any costs. Uh, you'd have to be doing an awful lot of work on GitLab before you start incurring costs. Uh, but you do, as part of the registration, have to provide a credit card, unfortunately. Uh, but just keep an eye on it. But I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that you, you incur minimal, minimal costs uh, when using this service. Uh, what you'll be doing in this lab is you'll be taking the movies app from the web app dev module and uh, using that uh, as part of your in your CI continuous integration pipeline. Now, just a brief word uh, on the, the, there's a slight difficulty with the folder structure that Roseanne is using. Uh, and I presume you're copying the folder structure that she, that she is using uh, as opposed to the folder structure that I need you to use in order for this lab to work. Now, what I mean by that is, if I just go to here in my case. So,
the way you have set up the movies app in the uh, web app dev module is you've got your base folder. Uh, let's suppose in my base folder is called that. And then when we open that up within that base folder, there is a subfolder called movies. Uh, and it's in there then if I open up that movies, that's where you've got all of your source code and that's where your node modules reside, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the Cypress tests, uh, that's where you put the Cypress tests from last week, uh, from the previous lab, sorry. Now, in order for us to uh, use the GitLab service on this application, what I, what we need to do though is, um, sorry, I should also say that the, the, let's, let's just go into this, if I just open up this folder, go into it. The Git repository resides at this level here. And so I can prove that by just going, in my case, uh, there's the Git repository, okay? But it's, it's up at this level. It's not inside in the movies folder. That was fine. And that's the way Roseanne wanted. And that's, that's perfect. However, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take this movies folder, make a copy of it. And I would advise you to delete the node modules first before you make the copy. Because it, it sucks up a lot of space. Just delete the node modules. Then make a copy of the movies folder. And I'm, I'm telling you in the lab to let's call the copy movies two. And inside in the movies two folder, load that into VS code. And inside in the movies two folder, that's where I want you to create your Git repository. Uh, so if I go down into the, uh, what would be your movies two folder, you're gonna create a Git repository here. And it's also, this is where we're going to put the GitLab configuration file. You may have forgotten all about that from two weeks ago, but that's what you'll be doing in today's, in today's lab. So the difference between the way Roseanne uh, has structured this app and the way I want you to structure it is, in her case, uh, you know, she's got her base folder, which is this folder. That's where the Git repository resides. But what I want you to do is to have your Git repository down at this sub level here. And you, you can't, you cannot just simply uh, take her code and go down into movies and create a Git repository here as well. You can't do that. You can't have a Git repository. You cannot have a Git repository here and a git repository up here that's just uh, complicates things too much for us really i'm not sure if i'm making myself clear or not but i've uh, i have stepped you through this in the lab as part of the startup so uh maybe i'll just let you work on it really rather than go on any longer okay i'm going to pause now and again allow any questions if there are any questions otherwise i'll let you work away on the lab i'll shut down this meeting but i'll be still available on slack and we can create another zoom meeting if we need to i'll just pause for a second in case there are any questions no okay uh so uh, let, uh you can get going on the GitLab lab and get in touch with me if you've got any issues. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.